My main objective today is just to boost morale because that's, that's kind of the best thing I can do in the position I'm in. And um, I might, you might have a cat in the hat moment coming out of this presentation where you feel like you have a few new tricks. But my expectations aren't terribly high for that. I really just want to gush about D. So let's get into that. Um, the main objectives of my talk here are just recounting the discovery process of D features during my project development. Now, in the beginning, I'm going to be particularly focused about some features, but a lot of it it just has to do with discovery of features and how I kind of fell into love with D. Um, I want to go over what really helped me to fall in love with D, and I hope that this will be useful both for senior developers like Walter over here, and um, I know I'm particularly conscious of people that are on YouTube, uh, and I want them to really feel like D is a, pro is a programming language worth using. So. I want to sell this really hard just through the natural excitement that I feel about D. Um, also, I hope to expose some cool D stuff. Again, I don't really expect most of you D veterans to, to learn anything that will make your head explode, but you might learn a few cool things you didn't know before. So that's my hope. So first off, it all started with Chuck, right? So Chuck gave a little introduction about how I got introduced to D and that was when he was teaching his analysis of programming language class, where he starts with ML, which is quite a shock for a lot of students because they do strictly OOP languages. They do C Sharp and C++. And once you get into higher level classes, you are totally free to use whatever language you have. But by that time, most people have adopted something that's very familiar, usually C Sharp. Some people do Python. Some people do Java. Um, but I, I like having that freedom. And it was really cool that uh, I was able to make this switch in the middle of the semester. Right? So he uses the functional programming in ML as a kind of segue through the functional aspects in D, and then explores a little bit more just about D itself. Um, at the same time, I was implementing the virtual machine with the embedded assembler in 4380, which is high performance computer architecture. It's where we get exposed to a lot of really low-level concepts, um, especially us as software writers um, touching the instructions for uh, an hardware architecture, different kinds of architecture. And it's really enlightening. One thing I learned, and that I'd like to say right now, is just how much work all the low-level plumbing is. <laughs> we learned that there is no magic. Uh, and so I'd just like to shout out my thanks for people like Walter and Andre who spend so much time um, just implementing all this cool stuff that we can use. Uh, so I decided to port and continue development in D from the VM that I had developed in C++ because I wanted to get better, I wanted to get better grades in my D assignments. That was the main motivation. I had no idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, but... <laughs> I actually liked doing it in D so much that I decided to stick with it and use it to implement the compiler later that we used to build on top. My experience of porting over to D, I had a few very strong initial impressions when I was porting over to D. And the first one is no more .h in .cpp. And for me, that was kind of a big deal because I like being able to prototype things quickly. And also, I, I discovered by doing this compiler and doing the virtual machine that I am kind of a systems programmer at heart. I like doing things from scratch, and I like doing things the right way the first time. So when you tell me in C++ that I should separate interface from implementation, I'm going to do it because that's the right way to do it. Right? Um, now, I understand that in D, we still have .di files for the interfaces, and we have .d files for implementation as well, but it's not so strong of a requirement. And that's something that really appealed to me, because I'm not going to provide multiple implementations of this project I'm doing in college. Um, so that was nice. The next thing was I sat down and asked myself, I don't have to deal with pointers anymore? Wow. Because pointers are like carrying an unsheathed knife in your pocket. You can't really make any sudden moves if you're touching <laughs> pointer-related code. I get it. <laughs> yeah, I 
And that I always kind of felt like when I wanted to change something in my virtual machine, um, sometimes it was hard because if I wasn't conscious of how I was using pointers, I'd get bitten pretty quickly. And sometimes uh, one of the professors that we have, Neil Harrison, he describes pointer errors as strange and wonderful things. Wonderful because you just sit there and you wonder what happened exactly. So another one that I, was really big for me is no namespace operator, right? Having to keep that context in my head of, oh, well, I need to go to this namespace here so I can provide the implementation for this class. Or worse, if I have like several nested classes inside of a namespace, for instance, that, that was hard for me personally to keep track of. I knew the identifier of the symbol I wanted to, to talk to, but remembering all the context for different namespaces and different classes was, did remove that obstacle. And that was just nice. It's just nice to have that. Um, so overall, the porting process actually wasn't so bad. It was mostly stripping stuff, to my surprise. I had maybe about 1K lines of code for the virtual machine, and I stripped it down. It went down to probably about 700 lines of code because of I ported it to D, and D does a bunch of stuff for me. Uh, one of the features that was most notable when I did this initial port were enum values. So in, if I were to make a flow diagram here of what I had in the first semester, we have our assembly file, and we put that into our assembler. The assembler puts out the bytecode, and we use that to execute in our virtual machine. Right? It shouldn't be world shattering to anybody here that's familiar with the process. Um, if we look at the source here, in our assembly, we have these string version of all these instructions, right? So we have an add right here. We're going to take R2 and add it to R1. In our architecture, which is kind of a risky, risk-based architecture, right? Um, we store on the left register if possible. There are a couple of exceptions. Uh, so you've got to subtract. I'm going to subtract the value in R4 from R3. Those are data registers. Uh, over here with load, for instance, this is a direct load. So this string right here represents an address that I've given a name. I'm going to load from data, put it in R5, right? And the same thing with store, except just the reverse, where we take the value of what's in our data register R6, and we store it into the address represented by result. Um, that's pretty much a one-to-one -one association between this identifier that I've got and some hard-coded values, all these integral values right here. So like for add, it's OE, sub is OF, load is OB, and so on and so forth. I don't resolve them here because I can't, right? I can't just tell you off the top of my head, and if I did, I'd, I'd be lying. Um, but enums are pretty much a shoe in right here for what I need. Now my question to you as a community is, if I'm not using D, Think of your favorite language. D. Other than D. <laughs> Other than D. Second language. Your second favorite language, huh? D1. D1? <laughs> but think of, think of your second or third favorite language as appropriate. <laughs> and I'd last to ask you, how would you implement that conversion between the string that I have and the enum value that I have, which in this case is an integral type, but Indeed, we can do a whole bunch of different stuff, right? How would you implement it? Just give me some high-level synopses. Right in Haskell. Right in Haskell. <laughs> associative array, maybe. An associative array, so like a map. Switch statement of doom. Switch statement of doom, yes. Or an if-elks, right? <laughs> just in case I'm lazy and just want to write the strings and not the characters. <laughs> in the case of C++, anyway. Yeah, so that's how I thought. I thought of basically those two solutions, which are I have a switch or an if-elk statement, which I can make pretty efficient. You know, like I can branch on different characters, and that way I'm losing absolutely no speed whatsoever. That sounded hard. That sounded too horrible for my taste, and especially knowing that I'd be changing the number of instructions that I had in there. I didn't want to do that. So I just did a map, which is pretty easy. And here's the source. So I made this method called git register up here, right? It takes a string. And the first time this runs, it will populate this static instance of the map I've got with the strings and the corresponding enum values right there. And so most of this function that actually runs is right here, where 
I'll just look up the name there in the register map and then just return it. If I can't find it, then it will return this enum value I call invalid register, right? Now, here's the follow-up question. How would I do this in D? No, no. What do you mean? Yeah, that's right. If you use standard.conv, the conversion module, I love, I, I just got to nerd out a little bit. I love the description for this module, by the way. Your one-stop shop for all your conversion needs. <laughs> How awesome is that? Anyway, um, yeah, in D, you just use standard.conv's too, because enums are smart. I have access at compile time to the name of the symbol, in this case, the enum elements, right? And the value that it's associated with. So I can just do, I can take all that stuff I just did and I do string dot two bang register because of UFCS, right? Universal function call syntax makes this look really nice. And if I want to convert it the other way, it's the same thing. I take the register value, in this case I'll like take R1 or something, right? And I just do R dot two bang string. Done. Ta-da! Now, the cool thing about this is that not only for this register enum, that's all done, but what about my opcode enum? And later when I did my compiler, my keywords enum and my punctuation enum, and the list goes on and on and on. It's already done for me. If I had to do that in C++, how many hours would it take for me to write correctly and then debug if something went wrong? Yeah. Put a gun in your mouth. <laughs> It's, it's horrible, but because I wanted to preserve original behavior in the, in the initial port that I made from C++ to D, uh, I kept the invalid register enum value, and I just shortened it down to this. Look how nice that is. It's like taking a bath, isn't it? So that's just something that I loved about it, uh, about using enums. And just to get, let you have compare here, this is about what? Nine lines of code versus implementation dependent number of lines of code right here, depending on how many enum elements I've got and how much I want to repeat myself. Yeah, these awesome. <laughs> this is actually kind of a big obstacle for the application I was doing it in because if you can describe everything in terms of enums, it's actually pretty convenient this way. So especially with the compiler, that's, that's pretty easy to do. Now, this actually led me to discover an interesting, it's not quite a hack, but it's, I can't imagine it being very performant as opposed to uh, like switch statements, for instance. But just one of the interesting problems that I ran into is like we have our store statement here, right? And halfway through the semester, Dr. Wellborn, who's teaching this class, sits us down and says, okay, so you have all these direct load in stores where you load from this static address that never changes but now we want to do something cool. We want you to use pointers. OK, well, how do we do that? Well, what he has us do is he has us just use a different, it's kind of an overloaded version of store and load here. So like we have a, an example load statement. Instead of specifying an address, what I'll do is I'll take the load statement. I'll take a register right here like we did up here, but we'll take another register that I've loaded with the pointer, right? So that will contain the address that I want to dereference to. Problem, I've already used the name for load and store elsewhere in my enum, right? So if we wanted to take a look at that enum right here, this, this is what it looks like. So for opcodes, I've got invalid opcode up here, and here's my store and load enum elements, right? I kind of trimmed everything else that wasn't quite necessary. So we've got, these are, this is the int version, and this is the byte version, right? And so to kind of differentiate, I put in underscore indirect at the end of each of these opcodes, and I just kind of copy-pasted, right? Because that, that's the only good way I can see of solving it. <laughs> and since I can just take a string and transform it, and I have this nice little pattern, what I can actually do is just create another case right here in the parsing code I've got. So what I've done is that by this point, when I'm starting to figure out how to parse the arguments, I've already thrown the opcode string into an enum value, right? 
at this point, I already know what opcode it should be, except for these four cases right here. Um, and so what I do is, it's really easy. All I do is just, I get a, a regex matcher for the argument. So front one is the first argument that I give it, and front two is the second, right? That's the max number of arguments we're ever going to get in our little architecture here. And then I just check to see if it's a register over here. And if it comes back as invalid register, then I'll just go to this case where I will take the opcode, convert it to a string, append underscore indirect, and then just turn it into an opcode again. Basically one line of code. How awesome is that? <laughs> uh, and I didn't have to write anything special for that. That's just using what's already available. Uh, what was that you said yesterday, Chuck? It's got a nuclear reactor included. Oh, well. <laughs> that was the, that's for the library, but whatever. You know. <laughs> well, this is part of the library, too, because 2 is part oh, of, the, yeah, yeah. of the library. Okay. So yeah. it uses information exposed by the compiler, but it's still a library function. So that was one of the interesting challenges that it was handled, and handled very well because of features that just naturally happen in D. Don't you love it? Mm -hmm. So that's pretty neat. I love it. It took a burden off my shoulders knowing that I wouldn't have to battle with low-level stuff every time I wanted to define a new enum, which happens actually kind of frequently. I don't know how, how often that happens to you, but uh, for me, it happens pretty frequently. So it's just super easy because D removes the obstacles. Now, something else I want to talk about is about the D standard library. And I honestly think that after using D, at least personally, my bar has been raised a lot. Especially after coming from C++, where um, I feel like I have to find a third-party library every time I want to do something. Um, it, it's really cool to see all these really neat and honestly very predictable modules that we use in the standard library in, in Phobos, right? I've never been so rewarded in D just by reading through the docs, like looking at the index that's on dlang.org and just seeing what's available. It's so nice. Now, I realize that because we have uh, this actually really good documentation feature, it's pretty easy just to say to newbies, hey, read the docs or get out, right? Um, that's not something I want to encourage at all because uh, one of the barriers that I had when I was coming into D is that I was pretty much on my own. Like Google didn't help me at all. I, it took me about a week to figure out that if, if I type in dlang instead of d, I'll actually get the results I want, right? So I think um, maybe greasing the initial in barrier to entry uh, is called for. I know that there are several tutorials and other things online. Chuck just showed me one that I'd never seen before that actually lets you edit code in line and run it right there. But um, I don't know about it. So getting word out is probably just going to be the main solution there. But there were several modules while I was developing the compiler specifically that it felt like I was trapped in a well or something, and a white knight came to my rescue, right? It's like, I've never heard of this module before, and when it, but when I did use it, it was great. Um, Gitopt is one of the big ones, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. I want to go into some depth there with Gitopt. Uh, other ones that I was looking at that were really helpful, especially later, was like standard CSV. So I started a new job uh, about three weeks ago. On the second day, since I'm a QA, they want me to start executing some test cases because they're in a phase where we're just doing regression testing right now. So we have all these cases that you need to execute, right? They use this web application called Enterprise Tester, and I didn't have rights to access it whatsoever. Like, it wouldn't let my browser even touch it. So that was kind of annoying, but, you know, first world problems. Uh, what happened is that I ended up talking to my coworker, and we found out that we can export to CSV all the test cases that he wanted me to execute. And I said, you know what? After coding all this stuff in D, I'm just super comfortable with D. Let's do it. And I don't know how this happened exactly, but it was a great coincidence where I looked up, I was trying to find a good CSV regex because I figured, OK, well, I'm just going to open up D. I'm going to use the regex library, and I'm going to parse it myself. And it'll, be, it'll take a little while, but I'm either going to do that or I'm going to sit here and twiddle my thumbs while I wait for test case access to come over, right? Um, 
I had no idea that standard CSV existed, but I found it in the Google search, and my jaw went like, wait, this exists? Holy cow! And, and because of standard CSV, it has a really nice interface. I'm, I just want to say that right now. I love the interface for standard CSV. It's so easy to use. Within half an hour, I was able to take all that CSV that I downloaded with tons of test cases, and I turned it into an HTML page with text boxes and check boxes on it. And, and I didn't even know about the module before. How awesome is that? <laughs> yeah. So this is kind of why I like to nerd out about D's, because when the nuclear reactor is included and you don't know it, it is a wonderful surprise. Uh, <laughs> so the other one, when I was specifically developing my compiler, was standard Gitopt, because a lot of times I think, especially when you're a student, um, especially at UVU when there's a big heterogeneous set of languages that you could use, teachers don't focus so much on tools that are available to help you know, because if one's over here teaching Python and the other's doing Java and this one's doing C Sharp and they're all doing these different languages for different assignments, it's kind of hard to specialize, right? Um, but I had never considered, I don't know how this didn't enter my head, but I'd never considered that there was a standard way to parse options. I've actually heard, before that point, when I started researching, I had heard of GNU's GitOpt right here. That, but that's from C, so how we do it is that we, we do this while loop, and I have all these different cases for different letters I'm going to use, because at this point, this is only when the short options were implemented, right? Um, there's get up long, but this is how it looks just for the short options. Sorry? Okay. Um, now, there are several things I don't particularly like about this. I know that this is C. Um, but this was the one big suggestion I heard when I was looking on the internet about using different GitOps okay. libraries, is that people are like, yeah, just use GNU's GitOps. It's great. It'll do the job for you. And a lot of legacy applications are, are developed using it. But I have several nitpicks. <laughs> First off, we've got a domain, little domain-specific language right here that's a little bewildering because I only use it for parsing options ever. Like, if I'm not testing options, I never have to learn this, ever. And it's not cool to have just that specialized knowledge for, for options. So that, that's one of my nitpicks. Second one, I've got this while loop that I need to implement the same way, and it's a little error prone. Um, I know I had a couple issues with it when I was doing it, and I tried to do it from scratch. And I ended up just copy-pasting and working from that copy-paste because it's just easier, and that's, that's not good. Um, second one. The third one here is the switch statement, and I don't have to rehash those risks that come with switch statements, but for me especially, where I'm very prone to forgetting to break, it's a little scary. It's like looking a, a dragon in the mouth. So I didn't want to do that. <laughs> when I looked at standard GitOpt, and I got super excited, and I started showing it to some people, they had some interesting comments. So for me, in this case, I looked at that and I said, that's standardized? Woo! You know, um, I just showed Travis here yesterday. I think he's probably the guy that's, that's newest to D here. He wrote his first hello world.d yesterday, or two days ago, actually. And when I showed him standard get up, he said, oh, that's cheating. <laughs> yeah. And most other students that I've shown at UVU while I was excitedly finishing my compilers, they look at that and they're like, no way. It can't be that easy. Which is kind of a, a funny complaint to hear, you know. Um, what I love about standard GitOpt is that it is just as fast as prototyping. So let's do, it's not a live coding session, it's, it's a scripted coding session, but let's do a coding session. All I need to do, import standard GitOpt. Not rocket science so far. I declare my opt variables, because usually the options we get are pretty analogous to those variables, right? Then here's my GitOpt call. Ta-da, I have, I just throw in the args, I specify the opt with an opt spec, and I just give it a pointer to the variable, and it's done. You've parsed your options. Congratulations, you've used standard get opt. Now, if you want to get something like the value of your variables, they're right here. Cool, just use right line. Yes, Andre? 
GitHub was one of the. That's not on. Moving the battery. I just changed the microphone. Um, so GitHub was one of the first uh, largish modules I wrote, and I, I thought if if I can do this, it's this is going to be a good language. It was as far back as 2006, and um, I got to credit one other language for it. Perl, right? Perl, yeah, you got it. So Perl has a similar GitHub package, which was just awesome. And I thought if I combine the the nice the simpli simplicity and nicety of uh, Perl's get up with the static typing of D, it's a huge win, and it, apparently it was. Mm -hmm. So how many people out here actually use standard get up? <laughs> Look at that. I'd say you were successful, Andre. <laughs> um, yeah, so after I just write out these variables that I want, this is an example bit of code that I like showing to students that don't really get what get up does. Then I just write what args are left because it takes my args for me, right? Question? Uh, have you tried putting another string between the like the option string and your variable? Yes, and I want, I'm going to show that in a second. But that is pretty cool, right? That I can just supply help text like that. Yeah. Anyway, so <laughs> yeah, cool. <laughs> um, so we can just write out all the args that we've got left here. And the cool part, the thing that I thought was really cool, is that it's got this automatic help generation for you because it stores the options in a struct that it, not only that it parsed, but that you specified, right? Which I think is immensely helpful. That's like one of the big, like, you know, painful considerations when I'm trying to get options to work. It's like, oh, wait, I've got all these options, but now I need to write docs for them, you know? So just the fact that I can do this, and as you mentioned, I can put another string in here for help text, um, that's about as fast as prototyping, which is really important. That's why people like using languages like Python is because I just write it out and it's done, right? Well, that's how I feel when I use standard GitOpt. Another cool thing that I discovered that you can do is since you can, you've interfaced it to just one function calls, you can do modular GitOpt calls, right? So when I was developing my compiler, specifically, I have this little function called parse IO files, right? And this is used as like the final, you know, clean up the args kind of call. All it does is it just takes a single out file option right here and it puts it in io.output. And then it'll take the rest of the args, everything but the, the program name, the path of what's executing, and it'll just treat it as an input because we haven't recognized it until this point, so it must be an input file, right? So that, that's basically how that works. I, I don't think anybody's gonna be particularly confused unless you're a newcomer and don't know what that is. But it just takes all the rest of the args. Just, that's all you need to know. Um, I combined this with a logging system that I developed because there were some points where I wanted debugging for certain operations and then there's debugging I wanted for different operations, but I didn't necessarily want it just to be all on or all off. So I made something called a channel logger, right? And what it basically looks like is, you know, here's my executable, like the compiler in this case. I give it a channel specification, which is just a string, and it uses each character as something that corresponds to a channel, right? So in the case of my compiler, I can have, like, the grammar step through is one of them. That would be this G right here in my case, or like the tokenizer or semantics, or assembly code generation, or, you know, it's just make it nice, flexible, and then I don't have to remove all the debug code I put in there. Um, to implement this, I, I used a class that has a couple of compile time parameters here. So the channel enum is just gonna be an enum of the different characters that you're gonna use as channels, right? And the preset enum is basically just gonna be uh, arrays that contain the different channels in it. So like, if I wanna just throw them all on, like I'll make a preset called all, and I'll just have it contain all the ENU members of the channel that I want, or something like that, right? It just depends on my imagination. Um, and so the main meat of the call is right there, where it'll just get channels and presets as options, and then it'll just let it pass through if it doesn't recognize something. So that, that's really the meat. That's what GitHub does for me there. When I use this, it looks like this. 
So like for my compiler, I have these different log channels right here, right? Like I have tokenizing in the grammar step, semantic analysis, simple resolution, blah, blah, blah. So I, I had just have to define that enum. I defined the channel preset enums that I want. Now these are kind of dummy ones. Quiet makes sense because it doesn't have anything. But I didn't do anything with verbose and debug. Well, that's everything. So um, I really only ended up, ended up using these two, but I can see how having different presets would be useful later, especially if I got a particularly complicated compiler and it's like front end, back end, maybe, right? So that was nice. Um, and then all you have to do when you want to get this logger class is you just make an alias. You just do channel logger and you give it the, the channel and the preset enums. And that's super easy because I'm doing this all with D. D just lets me do it because it's compile time stuff is amazing. Um, and so all I have to do is just throw those in there and then I can put it all together right here. So here is what my main looks like. All this, this is all my options parsing code in my main. That's all of it. So here's where I'm actually calling my options parsing uh, modules that I've made, two lines. And this is just checking to see if they want any help. That's it. I just check both of these structs that it, that it returns and say, hey, did you say help wanted? And if you did, then I just append the options to each other and tell it to throw out the help. And it's done. That's how it works with the assembler, too. The reason that I abstractified it is because there were several common elements that I had with my assembler and virtual machine, right? So that's just nice. That's all. And the only reason that I have these lines of code in here is because there's no constraints as to the number of in, like input files that I get from parse.io files. That's it. Other than that, that's all my options. All like, oh, that's about six right there so far. Um, now, for me, being able to not only define this so easily, but also reuse <coughs> it, for me, that's, that's an epic win. That's just awesome to be able to reuse uh, my options parsing that way because that's, that's the kind of thing you need to be able to produce faster when you're writing production code, right? Um, in fact, I got so ragey when I had to switch back to C++ and I didn't have standard.getopt that I actually, I said, you know what? I'm gonna learn C++ template metaprogramming. I'm gonna cut my teeth and I'm just gonna do it because this is gonna save me time. <laughs> and I did. Um, put it on GitHub. There's a link in case you're interested. It does most of the functionality that standard.getopt has. It was quite an adventure to learn, mainly because templates in C++ are oh so fun. Um, but this is what a sample call looks like. This is taken directly from one of the examples I've got in the repo right now and looks pretty much the same, right? And it'll give you back uh, from argc and argv, it'll give you a vector of strings of everything that wasn't consumed. So it's basically the same thing. And gosh darn it, I like it. It's so nice. The reason I did this is because in the same semester that I was implementing the compiler, we were also doing database construction, right? And I said, well, if I want to actually tell people about the database construction project I did, they probably will think it's weird if I tell them in, in any language that they don't recognize. Not because it's D, but because any language that they don't recognize, right? And so sadly, because of the resume point, I did that in C++. But um, having this library available now for me, it just comforts me a little bit when I do further C++ application development. So thank you so much, D, for inspiring this. <laughs> All right. So why are these so nice? Let's, let's talk a little bit about, about the theory. So, because when we have stuff like GitOpt that does the standard way of parsing ops every single time, reducing the reinvention of the wheel increases productivity. Duh, right? Um, more importantly, employers and clients, they're more willing to listen to you if you can tell them when you've got it done, not when you've got it done right, right? I'm sure everybody understands that point. And that's what happens with application development all the time. So who here uses uh, Google now? You know, OK Google? Kind of? Has anybody, had anybody been using it like beyond like a year ago or so? No? Well, I did. 
So I've got this cheap little, it's not cheap, it's a budget phone, but it's 150 bucks for an LG Vault, right? And I got it, and I, I used Google Now right when I got it, and man, it was slow. Oh my gosh. I'd say, okay, Google, it'd make a noise, and it literally took another three seconds for the voice input to actually start inputting the voice. Um, they got it done, and people loved it because of that. So everybody in the high-end phones is not noticing this, right? Um, but they got it done first before they optimized, and that's exactly what I think what made it so popular is that they were able to just get it done, and then they optimize it later. So even if you decide, like, oh, well, this isn't efficient enough, like, parsing of options, I don't think that's a concern with options, but with other things, like, in the standard library, could be. Like, if you decide this isn't efficient enough, I mean, it's a nice library, but I don't want to do it. We're systems programmers. We can just implement it from scratch, right? So having these modules available that just lets you get it done really quick soon is great, independent of performance, because then I can show it to somebody instead of just saying, well, if I do it like this, and I have all these different interfaces that I hook into, it'll be great. No, you can just do it and show them, right? And that's really important when you're trying to code something. Um, and that also leads into a point about the standard library, because it's got sensible defaults, you know? You can optimize later if you need to, and we're not afraid to do that. But having all those sensible defaults, like the garbage collector, and um, all these different modules that we use just makes things nice. And when we're starting and we're trying to get up the motivation to do and finish a project, that's what's important right then. <laughs> now, I want to quote Walter here on something that I found on the forums. Uh, he tells a story about when he was over in Europe. Right? He says, when I was in London for the 2010 ACCU, when the volcano stranded me there, I took a chance to tour the Belfast cruiser sitting in Thames. One interesting aspect of it was the ship's machine shop. It was full of carefully selected machine tools. It was pretty clear to me that an expert machinist could quickly and accurately make or repair about anything that broke on the ship. Sir, you can make do with fewer, more general purpose machines, but it'll take you considerably longer, and the result won't be as good. So for instance, I could do get up parsing and just implement it from scratch every single time with regular expressions. Do I want to? No. For example, I've used electric drills for years. I was never able to get it to drill a hole perfectly perpendicular. And I sympathize with you because I'm doing a lot of woodwork with my dad right now, and that is so annoying. <laughs> I finally got a drill press and problem solved. Not only is it far more accurate, it's much faster when you do a lot of holes to drill. I prefer to view D as a fully equipped machine shop with the right tools for the right job. Yes? It will take longer to master it than a simpler language. But we're professionals. We program all day. The investment of time to master it is trivial next to the career productivity improvement. <coughs> so I just got to say amen to that, because D simplified a lot of those one-time issues that I had to solve when I was coding this compiler. So uh, any questions until now? Comments? No? OK. Cool. I have a comment. Yes. Actually, it's a question. How many of you have written a compiler and a DBMS in one semester? What? We DBMS? really make <laughs> What is DBMS? Uh, he mentioned earlier that at the same time he was writing his compiler in one class, he was also implementing a relational database management system from scratch in the file system in C++ in another class. I just, we don't really mean to work them that hard here. Um, he chose to take the DBMS class. I guess I'm just excited because he never heard of D or at least never saw it before last October. And then between now and then, he's written the VM and the compiler and the DBMS. Of course, that was in C++. That doesn't count. <laughs> but let me tell you what, if I had to do both of them in C++, I don't think that would have worked out for a semester at all. <laughs> so um, one of the things I really liked about being at this conference is that I've heard about a bunch of great D tools that I hadn't really been exposed to before. So especially like with Brian's stuff over there, I've never really, I've heard of D scanner, never heard of D fix, never heard of Dustmite, never heard of live D parse, and all this other really actually pretty useful stuff. And that kind of tooling is actually really important, as I'm sure many of you will agree. Um, 
like I use DCD in Sublime, for instance. That is another one that I've heard of, uh, and that has helped a lot. But it looks like we have a comment here. Yeah, uh, Dustmite's not mine. OK. But it, but it is one of the D tools that are available to us. Um, and that's something that I hadn't really been exposed to before. So I've very, I'm very excited to play with it once the conference is over and I get to home and just code in D. So one of the excellent examples of great D tooling is RDMD. How many here actually use RDMD like in production, like for build scripts and stuff? So we got a bunch of hands over here. Why production? <laughs> Chuck is great because he he exposes us to RDMD right off the front. He, whenever he does a demonstration, he does RDMD for all the scripts, right? He never does DMD by itself unless he's just demonstrating how to use it. Um, and it's pretty convenient. It's like it's one of those tools that makes you ask, why isn't this implemented for other stuff, right? Because when I started using RDMD, it's like a great pair of shoes. You kind of forget that you're using RDMD and you just run as fast as you can, right? Um, <coughs> when I was doing my compiler project here, so here's a little graph of all the dependencies I have inside the compiler. I stripped out all the dependencies. I used dependency generation from DMD, by the way, to make this graph, and then I used Gephi to render it. Uh, so here, for instance, if I can zoom in just a little bit, yeah. So all this complicated network, these are all the interdependencies I have inside my compiler project, right? So it, it's kind of big, it's a little nasty. All these modules right here with a lot of arrows pointing at them, that's either the enums for uh, like literals and for types and other stuff for the compiled language that we do, right? So that's why I use it all. It's not horrible, horrible, horrible uh, um, dependency. It's, it's just using those enums. And here we've got like the logger, for instance, right? Which using the channel system, I kind of propagated everywhere. So it's not too big of a maintenance point. But um, yeah, this is not a, a trivial graph here. I would not like to type out all these names by hand if I had to do something like GNU's make and C++, for instance. That would not be fun at all. <laughs> but luckily, like with RDMD, I have a single command that I use everywhere. Whenever I'm testing and I'm wanting to use a specific source file, and that is, I just do RDMD. Even this right here isn't necessary. I just do that because I want to save the executable that I get out in the directory I'm using. And then I just do compiler main. And that's it. After that, it'll, it'll run it after compiling for me. And I just put in the args. It's wonderful. <laughs> so all I have to do is I just have to edit code and just run that command again. Um, <coughs> One of the enormous time savers for me when I was doing this project was I have this edit, compile, run cycle that normally I would do. And like with C++, I felt this with uh, when I was doing the database in, in C++, where it felt like it took forever sometimes and a little clunky maybe. But um, when I was doing the compiler, I, I totally forgot about you know, what it's doing under the hood because RDMD just abstracts that away from me nicely. Um, it's one of those tools, it's like, when you have tools like this, it's what makes you want to consider D when you're just starting a project and you're like, oh, I know how I can make this easy, you know? So RDMD for me is just, love it, love it. Um, so the last thing that I really want to hammer on is unit tests. Uh, I've had a couple of QA jobs now, so it, Attila was giving us in, in the last presentation, actually was pretty near and dear to my heart. Um, it's really interesting to talk to most developers about TDD because they have no idea what it is. I know. <laughs> um, but if I just want to test one module, for instance, with my, with my compiler, a lot of times I'd use this pattern where, you know, I finish this feature, great. Well, I'm going to start incrementally building this other thing now that I need to do. Well. I don't want to run the whole test case harness because if I've got over 25 source files, that can be a lot of unit tests. And even if they're all 10 milliseconds, that, that can be a lot of unit tests. So I don't want to run all that. Um, luckily with RDMD, you can just compile it, run it, and tell it just to run those unit tests all in one go. 
you know, accepting the dependencies that, that this works on. But just as a sample, I wrote this. We're like, I have a unit test for my register enum over here, right? So with my unit test, it just writes hello world, and then I just test with the conversion from string to enum value really quick, right? So kind of hearkening back to what we were talking about earlier with enums. If I want to test just this module, I use this command right here in our DMD. I just tell it where the root is for my packages with dash i, right? Unit test, dash main, and then I give it the source file name, and it runs all the unit tests, just like that. Minimal number unit tests run. It's kind of cool. I don't, I don't know uh, how many of you knew about that. I'm sure you do. But for me, when I see this kind of thing, it makes me feel like I don't have an excuse but to write tests and just to do them real fast. Yes, Walter. I'd throw a dash cov switch on there, too. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, and now you can do coverage analysis, so why not? Um, now here's one that's going to be an interesting puzzle, this last one. Uh, it's another hack that I discovered. I, I call it a hack, and you'll see why. Um, so there's one point during the development of my compiler where we actually don't just try to generate direct target code, right? We don't just output to assembly once we've got our uh, a representation of our semantics. What we do is we use I code, or intermediate code of some sort, right, which is a really high level assembly that we use. And that serves as a really excellent uh, launch point for starting to write target code, right? Now, there was at one point I was messing with the I code generator and suddenly stuff just started sega faulting. I was like, oh no. No, 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 don't make me look through 7K lines of code, please, right? Um, now, okay, the module wasn't 7K lines of code, but in potential, that's what it could have been because that's the length of my entire compiler, but I was pretty sure it was just this one module, right? So I look at it, and I'm totally convinced, okay, it's got to be this thing. I've done all this testing, and it doesn't seg fault if I output before this point, but I'm not sure which of the functions it is in my code generator, because what it does is it's kind of like a really fat builder interface, right? Where I could call it from any other point in my project just to simplify writing to the, the iCode file. Um, I didn't want to insert trace code in every single one of the over 20 functions I've got in there. That sounded to me like a nightmare, and I didn't want to do that. So I sat, and I thought, and I thought, and about five minutes later, I thought of a solution. You can actually get output from all functions in five lines of code. Now here's a hint. It's got to do with contract programming, but does anybody have an idea what that might be right off the bat? Invariant. Invariant. Absolutely right. So all I did is I've got my iCode generator right here. Got tons of functions. Don't have any idea which one it is. And I just do boom, invariant. And I just give it some dumb trace statement because the other output that I'm going to have in, in my log is going to help me to figure out from context, right? And with that, what I discovered in about 10 minutes is that actually it's not this module at all. <laughs> <laughs> so between the 20 different functions I had, I don't know how long that would have taken, but I'm going to guess it was going to take at least two hours just to go in there and to figure out which of these functions it was. But because I had this invariant block here that I was able to mess with, I did it in 10 minutes. That feels nice. <laughs> that, that feels really nice that you're able to do stuff like that with D. That's just another obstacle that D removes from you, right? It's got a nuclear reactor included. Um, so that's, that was a lot of the stuff that I wanted to focus on when I, uh, when I was writing this compiler in, in the virtual machine. It was a ton of fun. I am so glad that I was able to do it in D. So just some last opinions that I wanted to throw in. First off, um, I totally agree with what Brian said on the first day of the conference, where we in the D community should not be afraid to break stuff occasionally so that we can make progress, right? Now, I don't know about the whole repeating, you know, like D3 or something like that, but um, as long as you make transition as easy as possible and give priority to language development, I think 
most of us are going to understand, and it's going to be fairly straightforward to, to fix the brakes, right? As long as people are communicating. Um, second one is that I think making D easy to get into is going to be essential for these adoption to mainstream. And so I think a lot of it is getting the word out there. I've seen a bunch of resources that have come up, but most people that I talk to, I will talk to them about D and they'll tell me that they Googled it. But then they'll say, yeah, you know, I, I'm not really sure where to start. So as long as we can just provide that starting point for people and really kind of grease, again, that barrier of entry into D, I think you'll get a lot of people coming in as, as things get more mature and implement the stuff that we've talked about here at the conference. Um, so conclusion, just my conclusions on D. D removes obstacles from your path, and it makes you getting up and get, being productive fast. That's what it does. That's why you love it, right? You know it. <laughs> it's because when you think of how you're going to implement something, you're not worried about all this low-level stuff that you're going to have to implement because most of what D is about is modeling all this common low-level stuff that we've got. Nuclear reactor included, right? Um, and following that thought, D standard library to me sets a whole new standard. Like when STL came out, people's minds were boggled, right? And they were like, wow, this is great. But I feel that same way about D standard library after doing, using STL, right? So as long as we just keep the advances up and make sure we've got a fully equipped machine shop, I think, I think we're on the right track. I mean, C++ took a little time for people to notice and people to start using it, but they just started using it because it's so awesome, right? Well, D is the next step. And D's willingness to pioneer, which again may involve breaking occasionally, I think is what's going to make it better in the long run. Um, we talk about a lot of issues here at this conference that frankly are kind of unique to D circumstances. They haven't really been solved before. And they get heated because we're not sure what the solution is, right? But as long as, we're just, as long as D is willing to press forward and just solve the problems and take the time that's necessary to solve it instead of hacking around it, you know, provide a great, elegant solution, then it's going to be the language. It's, it's great. I love it because for me, it's my one language to learn all right now. If I want a script, I use D. If I want to do something heavy duty, I use D. And that's just because it's so powerful. It's, it's so convenient. <laughs> I just need to download DMD and I'm done. I got it. I got everything I need. Nuclear reactor included, right? So yeah, that's why I love D.